thank you for joining uh, this session, the Red Team Village session on our bug, our uh, pen testing engagement still relevant with bug bounties. This is session SBX XLT2, and it is meant to be a lightning talk, but um, it's we've uh, modified it a little bit to where we're going to do more of a um, it's going to be more of a discussion between the three panelists, and then we're going to bring in uh, the audience for questions and answers uh, the last uh, 15, 20 minutes of the discussion. So uh, to, to kick things off, um, my name is Joseph Malajanowski. I am part of the Red Team Village. Um, I, am also, I also run uh, Texas Cyber Summit in Grey Hat, and I'm uh, happy to be here at the RSA conference. I appreciate them inviting us and making them part of us, uh, making part of the, uh, the Red Team Village part of the conference. Um, as well, I'd like to uh, introduce Omar Santos. He is also part of the Red Team Village. And um, also Philip Wiley, he is also part of the Red Team Village. It, while each of us have our own things that we do, um, we're all members of the Red Team Village. So if uh, Omar, you wanna say a few words? Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, you know, thank you for everybody joining here today and giving us a few minutes of your time. And um, as Joseph mentioned, you know, we, we are all three, you know, volunteer at the Red Team Village. We lead uh, several activities there. But in my real work, um, I work at Cisco. I am a principal engineer, part of the PSER team at Cisco. So we are the ones that investigate all the security vulnerabilities for Cisco products and services. And what I do uh, from time to time is also work with many other vendors and many other uh, industry experts on on remediating vulnerabilities that affect multiple products, multiple vendors, and you know coordination of vulnerabilities, you know, with things like Cert CC and the Finland Cert and and the other vendors of the world, right, including protocol type vulnerabilities. But that's what I do for a living. Um, before that, I was actually doing pen testing for customers as part of a consultant gig at within Cisco. So we do that as a service, an advisory service, and um, and I also you know work with a lot of groups within Cisco that we have different bug bounties as well, so. Thank you, thank you Omar. Uh, Philip, uh, you wanna introduce yourself? Yes, uh, thanks everyone for joining and it's an honor to be joining my, my Red Team friends here, Red Team Village friends at RSA. Uh, so yeah, I come from a pen testing background. I've got over 23 years experience in IT and security with the past 17 plus dedicated in cybersecurity. Uh, I start out my security career first year and a half doing network security, moved into application security, and then pen testing. Uh, spent like a total of nine years in pen testing. The first five years was in consulting. I've been a red team lead. I've also been a bug crowd ambassador doing bug bounties and also educating people that want to be in bug bounty. And I've also worked at companies where I've managed some bug bounty programs. So I've done pen testing as well as bug bounty and then manage bug bounty programs. So I'm kind of familiar with that area as well as the benefits. So this is a very interesting uh, board uh, discussion to have today and I look forward to it. Thank you, thank you very much, Philip. Um, I, I, I won't spend a whole lot of time talking about myself. Um, I also work with Omar at Cisco. Uh, my job is a little bit different. Um, I worked in uh, federal for about 10 years doing work for different agencies. And a lot of my work involved doing cybersecurity and uh, infrastructure, um, building data centers and uh, security and stuff like that. Um, and prior to that, I worked for a, uh, a refining, refining company and uh, spent 15 years there doing just about everything from um, SCADA networks to building data centers as well. So um, this discussion is about our pen tests relevant with bug bounties. So from a, the perspective of pen testing, um, we'll kind of level set you on that. And then we'll also talk about bug bounties and level set you on that as well. So Omar, you wanna kick off the discussion about uh, pen testing since you did mention that. Uh, and the other thing I did wanna mention is that uh, Philip also wrote a book on pen testing. So if you haven't seen it, uh, go to Amazon and take a look, look for Philip Wiley. It's a great book um, on pen testing, uh, especially if you're new and you haven't, uh, you're trying to figure out if it's a career for you, it's a great place to start. So um, sorry about that. Um, Omar, you wanna go ahead and kick off the discussion on pen testing? Yeah, absolutely. And let's actually start by by having the the taxonomy, right? Of what 
pen testing, red teaming, zero day security researcher, whatever you, you know you want to call this uh, nowadays. Uh, so from a traditional perspective, whenever I'm going to talk about pen testing from now on, <clears throat> it's going to be <clears throat> the traditional assessment, organizational assessment, or you know depending on the scope, whether it's a, an application or a set of applications that a consultant will do. And give me one second. Don't want to cough in your ear. I'm losing my voice now. But the, that a consultant would potentially do within the organization or that you have a full-time employee, you know, doing doing this type of thing. So at the end of the day, it's finding vulnerabilities or weaknesses or misconfigurations before the bad guys do, right? Now, uh, traditionally, that has evolved throughout time. And it's going to continue to evolve. And that's where, where probably the, the reason of this talk is about, right? So a lot of people actually are saying that, hey, pen testings nowadays are potentially obsolete because of a couple of things. One is because the way that we deploy and develop applications is changing, right? Like if you look at the traditional pen test, let's say your scope is to find vulnerabilities in, in a financial application that you just created yesterday, even if it's that narrow, that application may be actually being developed with containers. That application is being instantiated with you know, things like Kubernetes that actually changes on a daily basis and a weekly basis and so on. So if it's a two week pen test, by the time that you finish, a lot of things actually change in there, right? So a lot of people are saying, okay, so is that a more effective way to look for vulnerabilities in our site or should we look for other things? And of course you have the buzzwords of moving security to the left. You're probably hearing it the whole week in here, right? From different vendors. At the end of the day, that's how you address security. It's not introducing the vulnerability or the misconfiguration from the beginning, but um, that's something that is, is, is shifting but not with automation and only with you know some tools in your you know developing process, you're probably gonna be able to pick up everything. So that's that's what I wanted to actually at least you know define what a pen testing is. There's another area of pen testing, which in my company we use a lot. So we do have pen testing, whether it's because of compliance that you have to have a third party coming in and look at an you know at, a, at an environment. Let's say we're we're you know again I work for Cisco, so the other sister element of you know zoom which is webex you know if you want to do a webex for the federal government you have you go through fedramp that will dictate that you have to have a third party pen testing company do an assessment even though if you have an army of people that are doing pen testing in a in a regular basis so there are other pen testing teams within an organization especially in vendors and what they try to do is find zero day vulnerabilities with an open book Open source, you know, open book with your source code, and then uh, you know, try to see if there's any any type of zero day versus actually running scanners or you know, running Metasploit, Nikto, you know, the commodity type pen testing. And in that case, is actually going really you know in depth. So whenever I talk about pen testing, I may also you know refer to some of those use cases as well. So it's, it's a pretty big spectrum, right? So, right. Thank you, and uh, Philip, from your perspective on pen testing. Yeah, I think that was some great information from Omar. And a lot of this is going to be dictated by the amount of time you have. So if you're like an internal resource for a company, when I was working for a large national bank, we had a month to do a pen test. Whereas when I was a consulting, the same pen test, we'd only get a week. And, you know, the more time you have to test, sometimes the more things you can uncover. Being an internal resource, you know the environment more. So it's more of a white box type test. You've got more of an idea of what's going on. But I do think even no matter what you're doing, if you have your own internal pen test team, it's always good to have consulting companies to come in from time to time to kind of grade you to see how you're doing things. Because there may be things they find that you're not doing. They may have some, some uh, techniques that you're not aware of. You take some of these boutique pen test firms that are highly skilled. They may be more skilled than your internal staff. So it's good to, to uh, augment with those type of things. And then the bug bounties too, as far as like for people that don't aren't familiar with bug bounty, uh, as far as a professional, if you're a bug bounty and you're doing this for a living or extra money, you're only paid per bug. And as a pen tester, you're paid. I get paid whether you know I find a bug or not. And I some of these bug bounty companies also offer pen tests as well. Something they started offering. Some of these companies have pivoted more into a pen test as a service. A uh, good example is like Cobalt. They started out as a bug bounty company, and now they're doing more pen testing as a service. 
So I think they're just the different variations. And even like Omar was talking about the, the depth of the pen test performed a lot of your normal pen tests, like performing vulnerability scans, validating those and see if you can exploit things to some of these boutique pen test firms that are doing more manual techniques and relying less on the vulnerability scanners. Although we can't rule out the, you know, the vulnerability scanners because it catches the low hanging fruit and there's sometimes things may get missed if you don't run those. So I think there's kind of a place for, for all those methods. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and for those that aren't aware of what pen testing is, it's a controlled simulated attack um, to identify potential flaws and weaknesses within a business, a network, a device, or an application. Um, so you, basically what you do is you set up the, um, the agreement or the boundaries as to what the pen test includes and what it doesn't include. So if you want to only pen test certain applications, you put those in scope. If you want to uh, pen test like only the DMZ, you put that in scope. Um, and um, like applications, uh, equipment, hardware, all that stuff. You can put it all in scope or you can just do a black box and tell them, you know, we're not giving you any information. Um, you know, you figure it out and everything is within scope. So a lot, of, a lot of what a pen test happens in a pen test happens based on a scope that is developed long before the engagement starts. Um, and with pen tests, I think we, we've seen some relevance with uh, supply chain attacks that have uh, just taken place. We've seen industrial control networks that you know have shut down fuel in the in the Northeast, um, and and these are prime uh, I, prime places for uh, pen tests to be done on a regular basis. And like Omar mentioned, um, just because you pen tested something today doesn't mean that tomorrow um, it's safe, because you're constantly changing the program. Your 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 developers are constantly adding new features and capabilities. And then you may be testing them to some degree, but you're not testing them in the entire environment. And that's what really needs to happen. You have to have a test, a really good test environment, a really good dev environment, a really good production environment. So, um, so from the perspective of pen testing, um, do you see pen testing um, evolving? Uh, oh, Mark, this is for you. Do you see pen testing evolving more to include maybe functions like bug bounties? I mean, we're gonna cover bug bounties at the end of this. But do you see pen testing, um, you know, growing to include that? Yeah, I think that, let me rephrase that. I would say that the organizations are going to be evolving to include potentially both. Both One, each of them are going to not solve the problem in isolation, right? Um, right? You have to have a balance. You have to have a balance from... Forget about pen testing and bug bounties that say they don't exist, you know, of doing just the normal hygiene, you know, good source code review, a good software development life cycle, you know, finding the vulnerabilities from the moment that you're doing a static analysis, software composition analysis, you know, things like that you can do before the scenes. Things are going to go fall the, down the crack. You have to do, as a matter of fact, I just saw a Darren mention pen test or risk assessment. You have to have a really good risk assessment from the beginning. Threat modeling comes into play, et cetera. Well, assuming that you're doing all that, the the things that fuel bug bounties is because you can literally crowdsource what some of the quote unquote commodity pen testing can actually do, right? So yes, you can actually if and they work very very good for things like you know some exposed web service, you know cloud platforms, etc., and where you have the masses that you give a scope because all of them, as you mentioned, whether it's a pen test or a bug bounty, you're going to have a scope. Whether the scope is this big or that big is, is the different thing, right? But uh, you give a domain, you say, okay, you know, you can, right now we're at rsaconference.com. You can only look at path.rsaconference.com and nothing else. Um, but you have hundreds of people that are looking for these vulnerabilities. And only if they find something, they're going to get rewarded. So you're going to get, you know, they, you're going to get some budget for that. In a pen test, it may be that they found one vulnerability, maybe that they find a hundred, right? So, so that's where the balance is now. However, in any of the two, you cannot say I'm going to have a bug bounty probably for something really, really depth that you're going to open the book and do source code review plus developing a zero day exploit. And um, what Philip mentioned about time is the most important thing. Time is one and money is the second one, right? So time is money, but at the same time, you also have to have a budget, uh, even for, for a commodity pen test. 
And in some cases, actually, you have to go beyond that. So to your question about evolving, definitely this pen testing bug bounty has to evolve. We cannot just stop it there, right? And it has to have a balance. And some people are now just calling this more in-depth things, not even pen testing. They're talking about, I've seen many different things, you know, being referred to even in, in, in this, this week here with zero day security researching. Um, that's another, you know, name. Uh, other ones, of course, we have the traditional red team, which is a true red team assessment. It goes beyond a pen test, right? You're doing potentially infiltration of a building, doing a lot of social engineering attacks, potentially simulating what an insider can do, getting hired through the organizations, looking at HR potential deficiency that you have, right? And, uh, and I'm not talking about like running a scanner and everything. It's actually manipulating people, doing a lot of social engineering. And that is actually something that with bug bounties is going to be very, very hard. I'm not going to say impossible because tomorrow probably somebody invents something like that, right? But uh, it's going to be very, 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 very hard to do as a, as a traditional bug bounty that we're seeing right now, right? And right. that's what you see in a lot of these companies, you know, Philip mentioned one, Cobalt, and, you know, Synac. I don't want to mention a lot of companies, actually, probably some of you are from that company here. Uh, but, you know, they're being, and I'm not talking about only vendors, right? But the whole industry, we're, we're shifting, right? But the, the last thing before I pass it back to Philip is regardless of bug bounties or regardless of pen testing, you know, those two terms, what we're talking about here is very pun in time, right? And especially with DevOps environments and things like that, that things change. That's where a lot of people, the more controversies, if you want some controversy here, right? So is, is, it, is, is all these even relevant anymore that, you know, I can instantiate 20 containers and then the open SSL vulnerability that you put in your report yesterday is already patched or vice versa, that you're using some Docker Hub, uh, you know, image in there for convenience and you're inheriting 20 more vulnerabilities two minutes after actually I ran my assessment, right? So, um, so that's another thing that, you know, of course you have to, you have to take advantage of the whole balance of not introducing the vulnerability from the same place and, you know, all the best practices that I mentioned before. Hopefully right. that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Absolutely. Thank you, uh, Omar. So Philip, same question to you. I, and I, and I guess that one of the questions that came up was um, if I'm in production and I have uh, this stuff going on, how do I ensure that I stay in production? Like if I'm selling widgets, you know, at Amazon or whatever, how do I ensure that I continue to be able to sell widgets while I'm either doing a, a pen test or a, or a bug bounty program? If it's an if it's an application, then then ideally you want to test in a user accept user testing or UAT environment that that you use to test the application in. That way, it's not in production, so you don't have to take it down. You know, most organizations are 24 by 7 by 365. So a lot of times they'll have testing after hours. And some people also want testing done during the day. So if it does break, someone's there to fix it. But in a test environment, it's a good, a, a good place to, to test. So that way you don't take anything down. And you have to really be careful that like in your OT and ICS environments, those are really critical. So a lot of things you don't see in those environments or people aren't setting up a a uh, test environment to test in because a lot of cases people just say this is an OT environment we can't take down production or risk injury instead of just building a UAT environment that they could test the pen test in there and also kind of to add to some of the the things I heard uh, as Omar was mentioning you know I've done pen tests before where it was like a low level vulnerability at the time I went back 90 days to do a retest and within that time someone discovered an exploit now it was a high level vulnerability. So, you know, something that's low today could be, you know, critical or high tomorrow. Right. Okay. Um, so we're going to just spend a few minutes talking about bug bounties, and then we're going to move on to questions and answers for the audience. Um, so from a bug bounty perspective, uh, Omar, actually, let's start out with you, Philip, since you're already online. Um, so from a bug bounty perspective, I know you've been involved with a couple of different bug bounty companies. Um, what are the benefits of doing bug bounties versus doing pen testing? Uh, as we kind of mentioned earlier, the, the amount of time you have on a pen test, like I was mentioning before, an internal resource typically can have more time to do a pen test than uh, you know, an external resource because the, the, the expense of it. So that's one of the advantages there because a lot of times these bug bounties can continuously run. That's one of the advantages there. Uh, sometimes people will just run it for a limited amount of time, but I think 
it's a real benefit to let that continually run, whether you're doing that through, uh, you know, an external resource managing that program like Bug Bounty or Hacker, Bug Crowd or Hacker One, or doing it internally yourself. So that continuous testing, I think there's a big advantage there, plus the number of people too, you know, uh, you know, most pen tests, there may be a few people depending on the size of the scope of the pen test, doing a pen test, but with your bug bounties, you could have hundreds or thousands of people actually testing. And what else is kind of interesting with bug bounties, you see like the DOD and some other areas of the government have had bug bounties performed. So yeah, one of the big advantages there is the number of people. And sometimes what you'll see in bug bounty is there's someone that's really great at cross-site scripting. And when they do bug bounties, that's all they go after. And people that are good at other types of things, someone that's really good with cloud related uh, issues, you know, they really focus on those items and learn how to automate that and find it quickly. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I think you're right about multiplying the workforce and, you know, crowdsourcing some of your security is kind of what some people say about it. And so Omar, um, what, what would be your take on bug bounties over doing pen testing? I think it's, it's all complementary, right? Um, again, it's the balance. Uh, I'm not going to pick one side that hey, bug, you should do bug bounties before pen testing, et cetera, right? But at the end of the day, I saw in the q and I guess I'll take advantage of this as somewhat of a Q&A, but I saw a comment from Juan Juan Martinez in, um, in the chat. It says, with bug bounties, you will find what you can find with pen testing. So in some cases, yes. In some cases, no. So I'm going to capitalize on that to, to explain what I mean. And uh, there are bug bounties and there are also bug bounties, right? So depending on what the type of bug bounty, the type of application that you're testing, the type of scope, you may be very successful. Like DOD has been extremely successful in bug bounties. You have been seeing a lot of presentations for them, how they can scale. And uh, and they have a lot of money, right? I mean, it's not that we're talking about a, a, a hundred you know, people employee. They have a lot of resources and everything that is still being successful now. That type of bug bounty program is not going to be to the classified systems, right? Uh, so it's, it's, it's a little bit different, you know, environments. So for things like a web service, right? Some cloud service, something that is, uh, I'm not going to mention names of companies or anything else, right? But services that you actually use every day, right? Yeah, public facing. Uh, some, some public facing things you can absolutely scale the most. Probably if you want to have these as far as a, uh, just finding the number of vulnerabilities, you're probably gonna get more for bug bounties. In some cases, you're obligated to do pen testing because of regulation. So in that case, you're done because you have a bug bounty program, you're gonna have that checklist. So that depends on your geographical location, the type of industry, the type of regulation, I'm not gonna go there, right? However, what I'm seeing that a bug bounties and pen testing, but more bug bounties have to also evolve is the way that we look at the reports of the vulnerabilities. In some cases, what I have seen, not only in my company, but in other ones that I collaborate with, is that, yes, we find vulnerabilities. In a lot of cases, actually, bug bounties, I guess, fortunately, unfortunately, we find the vulnerabilities, but they are known vulnerabilities. They're not zero days, right? Um, there are, yeah, you're running these updated packages. You're, things that you can also do in, 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 a, in a pen test. However, in some cases, they are finding zero days. In some cases, those zero days, and it's not so much of the bug bounty, but the organization that is doing that, it may affect other people in the industry. So it may be that you find that in some application that you created, with that same vulnerability, you know, is probably in an open source package that you're not reporting out, or you're just mitigating and not patching and things like that. So the coordination of fixing the underlying problem has to evolve. The other mm -hmm. thing is that uh, there are a lot of really cool efforts now in the industry. I know that HackerOne has one. There's a, the Internet Bug Bounty Initiative on where we should do the same thing for open source, which is everybody here, 90, I think that the Ponymon Institute says that 95% of uh, people you know, that develop code, they use open source. I would say probably it's a, close to 100%. So finding vulnerabilities in there, we also have to evolve these type of programs to be able to scale, right? A pen test, only a point in time into a third-party software component, like an open source component, probably will not scale. So it has to have a balance, right? Uh, I'm not going to pick and choose a side, right? Uh, again, with bug bounties, you cannot do the social engineering type aspect. You cannot probably do that depending on the scope. So, so you have to have a balance between both. Okay. And 
So at the, at, we're going to take questions. So if you um, would like to type in, if you have a question and you want to ask a specific person, you can say, Philip, uh, what do you think about this? Or you can say, Omar, what do you think about this? Or you can say just general question. What do you guys think about this? So I think from um, all three of our perspective, we believe that, um, and I, hopefully I don't put words in everybody's mouth, but from our perspective, we believe that you have to have um, a system in place that includes red teaming, um, pen testing, and bug bounties to be able to have your to have a a you know uh, I wouldn't say defense in depth, but more of a um, offense in depth <laughs> type look at your environment. So um, I think and Philip, uh, you can um, uh, come in and say something about that if you want to. I know I I believe I understand where everybody stood on this topic. Yeah, that's even like your vulnerability scanning. It's a tool. There's always there's a place for it. You know, you're doing your re reoccurring vulnerability scans, whether it's every couple of weeks, once a week, or once a month. That's ongoing. So it's just like your your pen tests are part of it. Your vulnerability assessments and then adding bug bounty. It's another tool. And one of the areas that you don't see as much on the bug bounty is outside of you know there's like some car hacking bug bounties some hardware, but one of the things you don't see as much is network. So a lot of that's still part of the uh, part of the traditional pen testing world. And last year I was interviewing with a, a well-known uh, specialty pen testing firm. And they were telling me that it's easier to find uh, web application pen testers than network pen testers because of the bug bounties. People are getting experience with that. Right. Okay, so we do have a couple questions now and I'll start asking them. Um, if a company wanted to engage in a in the bug bounties, um, how would they go about it? I'm assuming that you're taking this from the perspective of an end customer, and you don't have internal resources to do this, and you're wanting to um, engage an external company to help you uh, with a bug bounty. Um, so, um, Philip, you want to talk a little bit about that, if. Sure. If you have a company and you want to, uh, and, you're, and you're worried about bugs, how would you, who would you engage? I, I guess not who would you engage, because I think if you engage HackerOne or BugCrowd or um, any, any of the other ones, they kind of almost engage the same way. But if you want to kind of talk about that. Yeah, I think, in my opinion, I think that's a good thing to outsource. You can do that internally. You could hire someone, but to find someone that knows how to run a program like that, then you've got their salary plus benefits. And so it may work out more cost effective to hire another company to do that. And then, you know, you could run with that one company for a while. And just like it's a good idea to change pen testing companies, you could change to a different bug bounty company after so long, you know, uh, to, to get, you know, a different view of things and, and, and see how that works out. But some companies do it internally. So there's going to be a lot more, a lot more work to that. And, you know, you'd have to find someone that really you'd need to find someone that understands that space to be able to come in and set up all the process and procedures for that. And someone also asked the question about vulnerability disclosure programs. So this kind of fits in well too. Disclose.io has some good information on, on disclosure. Uh, but yeah, I would, you could either hire a third party to do it or do it yourself. And another option would be is to bring in someone like a bug crowd or hacker one and kind of learn how they do it, develop that internal knowledge and then take it over internally if you wanted to. Okay. All right. Thank you. Elmar, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, and as a matter of fact, I'm just looking at all the questions. Some of them actually are <laughs> answering uh, some of them, but to, to, to answer that one, actually both of them, because you, you, you went into vulnerability disclosure. So disclosure is super important from, you know, it's very close to my heart because that's what I do for a living. And um, whether you have a pen test that is internal is only, only to you, you don't have to disclose that much. If you have a bug bounty and the vulnerability is only to you and this doesn't affect others, there are, there are companies that basically they just go silent. They don't have a vulnerability disclosure program. They don't have a vulnerability disclosure policy. Um, so, you know, in some cases, some of these bug bounties are private. Uh, they're not, you know, known. So in, in some of those engagements, they may require that there's no public write-ups of the vulnerability. So it's, it's all over, right? Um, I'm not going to say which one is better, right? But what I will always suggest is at least have a couple of things, whether you have a bug bounty or not. Number one thing is have a vulnerability disclosure program policy that you can then, you know, if something goes sideways or anything, you can actually always refer to it. Second, to people to know how to contact you, right? Whether, again, you're paying money or not. 
But if somebody finds a vulnerability in your site, that's something that we super struggle all over, you know, regardless of bug bounties and pen test. There's a lot of effort in the industry, like securitytext.org, if you go there. And they also, the guys from Disclose.io, they're trying to actually come up with innovative ways on how to put the vulnerability program information, your policy, your contact information, your PGP keys in a DNS text record. So we have to definitely modernize the practice that we have on vulnerability disclosure, the policies and everything. And then the other thing, another question that came in that I'm super eager to, to answer is by Sam. Um, Sam asked, any thoughts on where breach and attack simulation, BAS, fits in? Kind of a hybrid type of approach, right? So. Now in the industry, I laugh because we have so many buzzwords, right? For many different things. You have red teams, purple teams, you know, blue teams, C search, the SOC, the SOAR, the SIM, you know, so many acronyms. But anyways, adversary emulation absolutely has its place, right? And as a matter of fact, another way that you can scale, even if you don't have a bug bounty, right? And you let's say you're an enterprise customer, you have just a few applications and you don't have a lot of budget, there are a lot of things that you can do in as far as emulating what an adversary can do. So it's a balance, right? It's not so only dedicating 100% of your budget in pen testing or you know 80% in bug bounties and 20% in back testing. No, it's not like that. You have to have a balanced approach. Merging the two with that type of automation, um, especially adversarial emulations, even if you, if you don't have the resources, starting using tools like Caldera from MITRE, right? And then go through the MITRE attack framework, and I try to emulate that you know, with, with different agents and then try to find gaps. Because at the end of the day, what you want to do is be, become better and then learn from the lessons. If you're dedicating, let's say 50% of your budget to actually find vulnerabilities, but you're finding the same things over and over, the same weakness, the buffer overflows, the cross-site scripting, the cross-site request forgery, and you didn't learn how to actually avoid it from the beginning, then it's a moot point, right? You can you can just cancel your bug bounties, cancel your pen test. You're not gonna you're not learning from these mistakes, right? right. That, that's the thing that they, I have to reiterate the high balance of everything that you have to do. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated world, but you know it has to have a balance. Yeah. Uh, do you want to mention? Uh, do you want to answer the next one, which is how do you convince uh, management to fund um, a bug bounty versus? Well, they're already if the company's already doing pen tests but management doesn't see a value in bug bounties. And not every company will see a value in bug bounties. So um, you, want to care, you want to answer that one? Yeah, I can come on. That, that's a pretty controversial one. Um, <laughs> depending on the, the culture of the company, right? You may have to have different tactics on convincing, you know, to get budget for it. Um, Pentas, as a matter of fact, are a little bit easier to to uh, convince because regulations in some cases are actually requiring you, you have to have a pen test you know, every year, even if you actually were able to find more things with a full-time employee you know, internally, but you have to have that check mark. So they, ha- they cannot say no. With bug bounties, the, one of the benefits from using, not doing it yourself, but using a platform is that the administrative hassle of the duplicate reports, how much you're gonna pay for this stuff, you know. Uh, dealing with all those type of administrative tasks it reduces significantly. So if you want to actually probably just get started developing yourself, it's going to be harder than outsourcing it to a company like, you know, I'm not going to mention, you know, but there's a lot of companies out there, right? And uh, so the way to convince people, I have seen a, a plethora of different ways that people try to do that, right? One is saying, hey, you know, these are the, the goals of the organization of new applications we're coming in, new acquisitions that we have. We cannot scale with this team of people to find the vulnerabilities. Let's actually come up with a bug bounty program. In some cases, they actually start an internal bug bounty program. And we actually have done that even at Cisco, right? So we have bug bounties that are external, some are private, some are you know, because of acquisitions like Meraki. And we have done internal and we have, sec- we're kind of spoiled because we have security research teams that are doing that and we have different things, right? But but uh, in the traditional sense, in many cases, what you do is you, you show proof that there's some value into it rather than just say, hey, give me a million dollars so I can just, you know, hopefully 
hope that somebody's going to report a vulnerability. You can actually start developing small environments. And I always recommend that don't only concentrate on developing just an external outsource bug bounty program, just have that culture in your system that, or in your environment that people now want to actually go deep. If you're a developer and you're, you know, inherited this application, then, you know, spend some time. And if you actually out of your own time, you're finding the vulnerabilities, have some type of recognition program internally. It doesn't have to be monetarily. That can be, you know, uh, the hall of fame internally of the best, you know, developers. Just look into different non-traditional ways to compensate for, you know, a good guy for finding vulnerabilities before a bad guy does. Anyways, right. I talk too much. So Philip. <laughs> yeah, Philip, you want to add to that? No, that's a great idea. I really can't think much more to add to that. And I, I like that idea of, of rewarding people and internally get them involved, you know, they, uh, it kind of, you know, kind of, uh, motivate your developers to, to learn more about secure coding and to look for those things. So it kind of makes, uh, makes it a little more interesting for them. So I think that's a, that's a great idea. Okay. And we do have uh, one more question. I don't know if we'll have time to get through it all, but we'll, I think we have about a minute each to be able to talk about it. It says, um, Pen testing requires internal access. How is this done from the perspective of standard bug bounty platform um, companies? Obviously, a holistic approach is needed to combine them all um, throughout, but um, any way to replace networking pen testers with these programs? Personally, uh, I don't think so, but Philip, you want to, again, I think you, it needs to be, you need to have multiple programs in place, but go ahead, Philip, and answer that. Yeah, I think as far as like the network related internal network, I, I'm sure there are companies that do that, but you don't hear as much of it because just like talking to the pen testing company that said they have an easy time finding web app pen testers because of the bug bounties. So there's not as much of that going on. I'm sure there is. You can send a Dropbox out like you would uh, on a pen test, but one of the things you're going to run into there, if you're doing that crowdsourced model, getting something that's going to be able to hold, you know, tens of 10 something, a hundred something in the tens or hundreds of people to be able to on that network testing at the same time. And do you want that? Because then that crowdsource model is putting a big load on the network and that would definitely have to be tested after hours. So I think you'd have to be really careful the way you do that. It'd have to be a scaled down approach. You really couldn't go at it the same way you do the external application programs. Right. Yep. And it's a good point. Networking is a specialized field, especially with pen testing. So the suggestion that I would make would be look for a company that that has that those resources that are specializing in that capability as well. Uh, Omar, you want to add to that, and then we'll close this thing out. Yeah, yeah, really, really quick. Um, if you're looking into emulating what an insider can do, whether it's networking or putting a backdoor in your application that you're doing just you know yesterday because of supply chain you know issues, you're not going to find that in in bug bounties. You have to have some type of internal assessment, simulate, you know, what in a, a true, you know, insider can, can do, um, find restrictions in your bug databases, in your forums internally, you know, things that can actually get a lot of additional information that, of course, an outsider cannot do that. I know that some of the platforms, the bug bounty platforms are kind of having that hybrid approach. You have a bug bounty part of the same subscription or service, then they can sell people internally to emulate that, right? But it's not the traditional bug bounty of, you know, a crowdsourcing that. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you, Omar. All right, so I think that wraps it up for us. If you want to find out more about the Red Team Village, go to redteamvillage.io. Um, we, Omar, myself, and Philip all hang out on Discord uh, 24 hours a day with no sleep. So feel free to engage us there. <laughs> um, thanks everybody for joining and uh, enjoy RSA. Thank you, RSA. Thank you. Thank you.